Is there any year for horror better than 1981? I'll go ahead and answer that for you. Hell no. Let's review Madhouse. Madhouse stars Trish Everly, Michael McRae, and is directed by Ovidio G. Asantis. What's up, guys? Quite a while ago, I reviewed a movie called Alice Sweet Alice, and that movie was recommended to me by uh, my friend Damian Maffey. And he, another movie that he recommended was Madhouse. This is the Arrow release of Madhouse. I love Arrow releases. They're just so beautiful, filled with great special features. But the big thing, too, is the transfers are always completely exquisite. Like, this movie looks like a brand new movie. It looks gorgeous. But uh, I'd never even heard of this movie. Let me put that back. But one thing that's interesting, among many things that are interesting about Madhouse, is that it was filmed in Georgia. And I used to live in Georgia. It was filmed in Savannah, Georgia, but it has an Italian director, so it's kind of a hodgepodge. And I always get interested in uh, horror movies or just movies in general that are kind of a hodgepodge in that the directing and the actors are all from different locations or different nationalities, which is a common thing with Jallo films. This is not a Jallo film, but it was directed by an Italian director. And so what's interesting is behind the scenes on this movie, the director didn't understand English at all. So uh, they had an interpreter on set to interpret what the director wanted out of the actors. And sometimes that bleeds through. Sometimes you can see that in the performances. Remember what I do? How it would hurt. Huh? Well, I'll make it hurt again. And I did see that before I even like knew this information. I, I thought that there was a little something weird, not in a, uh, a bad way, but it just felt a little eccentric like Jallo films feel eccentric. But like I said, this is not technically a Jallo film, but we got some stuff to talk about. Trish Everly, she plays Julia. She is uh, a teacher for the deaf and she has this sister named Mary, this twin sister. And just to backtrack just a little bit, there's a scene at the very beginning of this movie, which is very strange, uh, where you see this lullaby being sang, uh, these two sisters, one sitting in a rocking chair and the other one, the camera like zooms in slowly. And then you have this like horrific scene where uh, one of the sisters, she bashes the other sister's face in with a rock. After watching that scene, I couldn't tell if that was supposed to be a real person or a mannequin because it is blatantly obvious that it's a mannequin. And this came out in the early 80s when, you know, before we had CGI and all that stuff. So uh, it's a little confusing at first. But anyway, in the present day, Julia finds out information from her uncle that Mary uh, is in the hospital and she wants to see her. And so then after that, we find out that Mary actually has this disease that causes her face to look deformed. So right away, I'm a little confused there because in the beginning of the movie, it looked like the sister bashed the other sister's face in. Uh, and then after thinking about it, it could be like a manifestation of Julia's guilt over her sister because, you know, this is a, a character that has a sibling that has a very different path in life than she does. You know, Julia is pretty successful in life. I mean, she's a teacher. She has a normal life, actually. You know, and her sister ha has this deformed face. She's very angry and she's just pissed off at life in general. And she's homicidal, which uh, makes this movie even more interesting. Remember what I do? How it hurt? Huh? Well, I will make it hurt again. I'll make you suffer what I've suffered yet. <laughs> So then, Eventually, um, Mary escapes the hospital, and then these killings start happening throughout the movie. And one thing you need to know about this movie is that the birthday of these twins is coming up, and it, it even spells that out in the movie, you know, four days, three days, two days before the birthday. So there is this big birthday party at the end of the movie. Now, before I go any further, this will be a spoiler review. This movie came out in 1981. Sure, a lot of you might not have seen it. Uh, I will say it's definitely worth your time. But um, I'm going to talk about uh, some spoiler, spoilery type stuff throughout because I think it's essential in this review. 
And the main reason I wanted to do that is because you're gonna draw direct comparisons to another 1981 movie. Happy birthday to me. As a matter of fact, when I was talking to Damien about this movie, he saw us kind of glowing over happy birthday to me and he said, Madhouse is the better movie. Or I think that's what he said. I don't wanna speak for Damien, but I think he prefers Madhouse over happy birthday to me. And I get that. It's a very unique movie. And I think uniqueness in a slasher movie is always a good thing because let's face it, slasher movies, as much as I love them, they're all pretty repetitive. This one does have that going for it. Having said that, after seeing this one, I do very much prefer Happy Birthday to me. I think it's just a more fully realized version of a birthday slasher. But this one does have some things going for it, for sure. Now, one thing that's very unique about this movie is the way the kills are played out. There's only four kills, I believe, in this movie, and two of them are via a Rottweiler dog. automatically I started thinking of the, like movies like Cujo, you know. I do like a good canine kill in a movie. Don't get me wrong. And I, I will say the kills in this movie, especially the canine kills, are really bloody, really graphic. So that's one good thing that this movie has going for it. And another thing I really like about it is the character of Mary. You know, she's a very psychotic, crazy type of character, very unpredictable. And throughout this whole movie, Allison Biggins, who played Mary, I think did a really great job, very whacked out. And she suited a lot of the scenes that she was in because visually they looked very striking, you know? Every time Mary was on screen, she definitely had my attention. Now, jumping into the spoilery stuff here, just so you guys know, the uncle is another really crazy whacked out character because at the beginning of the movie, he's the guy that tells Julia that, hey, you need to come visit Mary. She wants to see you. And so once she sees Mary, Mary pretty much assaults her. And from this point, Julia is just a basket case. You know, she's really scared and worried. She finds out that Mary escaped. But jumping back to the uncle, later in the movie, in the last act, when she gets up in the house, uh, we find out that the uncle kind of orchestrated this whole thing, orchestrated Mary's escape. And he's just a complete loony. This is one of my problems of the movie because somebody that's as crazy as this guy uh, apparently is, I mean, it's, it's all there. You can tell this guy has a couple screws loose, for sure. I mean, he's whacked out of his head. I can't emphasize that enough. So then in the beginning of the movie, he seems like this normal, sane type of character. I can't buy that because when somebody's that insane, there's no way they can keep it together for that long to orchestrate this whole thing. So I think they could have dialed him back a bit in the end. I, I still think somebody that's that intelligent can orchestrate something like that and carry it through in the end. But then when he just goes full on bonkers, then you're like, this guy's out of his mind. There's no way he would, he would try to orchestrate that whole thing. But that's really one of my own big problems with the movie. Um, in the end, one of my favorite kills uh, in a slasher movie happens to be in this movie. It surprised me because, because it's just something I've never seen before. When the uncle has his back turned to Julia, she takes a knife and she repeatedly stabs him over and over and over again in the back. That scene just has like Italian giallo feel all over it. It made me think of like Argento and Fulci and all those guys, how they handle violence in a movie. This is not like American violence. And don't get me wrong, you know, you have movies like The Burning. I mean, we have Tom Savini, of course. But I'm just saying this felt very giallo, the way this guy was uh, was killed. I mean, the blood and, and the flesh and all that stuff's just like hanging off of his back. And you could tell a lot of work went into that kill. You know, they could have played it easy. They could have just put this, the knife in the back and then called it a day uh, and went to catering. But no. You can tell that they put a lot of effort into this scene. And it's really kind of the, the money shot of the movie, as well as the big reveal at the end of the birthday party. Visually, that scene looks really, really great too. It's, it's a bit brighter than the reveal in Happy Birthday to Me. And I'm not gonna say one movie copied the other because they both came out in the same year. So they were probably shot around the same time. It, it might be, just be a happy accident. Uh, and I do like that visually the, the two scenes do look uh, a, a little different than each other. But all in all, they're pretty much the same type of scene. Now, one other issue, just a slight issue I had with this movie, is there's this character, Amantha. Uh, and she's an older character. Her kill, I, I thought, was kind of lacking. 
and just didn't make sense uh, structurally really because they're trying to lead you to this rocking chair kill and she you know she willingly goes to the rocking chair because she's trying to escape uh, the killer and then too much time goes by for her to just sit there and the killer be behind her and, and I get that they're trying to ramp up the drama and the tension in this scene but it felt like it dragged on a little bit too long and I was just thinking just get out of the chair just run away you know and she didn't do that but overall guys this is a movie that definitely stays with you I watched it a couple days ago and I, I could not get it out of my head and I think that's a really good thing so I'm definitely going to give it a purchase worthy I would definitely check out Madhouse if you get a chance um as far as like my top 50 slashers list would it go on that list no I don't think it would I, I think uh it's not as good or at least as memorable as the movies that I did have on that list. But it's still uh, a, a very unique film. And you know what? It's one of the few slashers, if any, that has like Rottweiler kills in it, which that's a good thing. So I'm giving it a purchase worthy. Um, anyway, let me know in the comments uh, your thoughts on Madhouse. Have you seen it? Let me know if you liked it. Also, be sure to come over to Killer Flicks, where we talk horror all day and every day. And on Fridays, we do Free Fall Fridays. Follow me at Drum Dumbs on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Letterboxd. Anyway, guys, thank you so much for watching. Have a great day, and Drum Dumb out.